Hi, Chris Potts here. This is part three in our screencast series on cement decomposition. Our focus will be on quantificational determiners. Screencasts one and two are strict prerequisites for this screencast. This is compositional semantics and we're building things up for more basic parts and the basic parts involved in this screencast were introduced in the previous screencasts. So we're jumping right to section 4.7, quantificational determiners. These are the most complex meanings that we'll consider, and so there's a lot to take in here. We'll try to take a few angles on the material to help it sink in. Even though the meanings are complex, the framework for these meanings is pretty simple once you get used to it. And do keep in mind von Neumann's observation. In mathematics, you don't understand things, you just get used to them. That will certainly be true for these complex semantic concepts. Let's begin getting used to these determiners then. I think it will help as we go through this if you have this simple syntactic structure in mind. We're looking at the simple sentence, every child studies. The determiner is every, and it forms a constituent with what we call the restriction. Here it's child. Because they form a constituent on their own, the meaning of every will also combine first with the meaning of child in this structure. And that will deliver a meaning for the subject noun phrase, every child. After that, we combine with the verb phrase, here the intransitive verb studies. In our framework, every will control all of this. It combines with child, as I said, and the result of that takes the meaning of studies as its argument, and that will finally bring us to a truth value. Let's go a level deeper and see how that works using 21, which is our actual analysis of every. This is a function that takes two arguments, x and y, both sets. Once it has them, it will deliver a truth value. The x argument, the outer one, associates with the restriction. Once it's filled in, the function is looking for a second set argument, y, and this will correspond to the verb phrase in all our examples. Once the determiner has x and y, its arguments, it returns true if x is a subset of y, else false. In other words, the core truth conditions say that every x y's is true just in case the x's are contained in the y's. And that's semantically just like saying for any entity a, if a is an x, then a is a y. In 22, we start to reveal the composition more deeply. If every combines with child, then we get a function that, given an input set y, will return true if the set of children is contained in the set y otherwise false. And so when studies comes in, as in 23, there are no more lambdas, that is, no more arguments to worry about, and we're assessing directly whether the set of children is contained in the set of entities that study. Let's look at sum. It's the same pattern, a function that takes two arguments, both sets, and relates them in some way. Here, for sum, we say that the intersection of the two set arguments is non-empty. In other words, we evaluate whether there's an entity A that has both properties x and y. And no is similar too, same structure, but now the core claim assessed is that the two arguments have no entities in common, an empty intersection. In other words, we return true if no a is such that a has both properties x and y. I hope you're starting to see the framework through all of this. It's always lambda x, lambda y, and we're always returning one of the truth values. The only thing that changes is the core claim, the core relation we're defining between the two set arguments. So for at least three, for example, we say that the cardinality of the intersection is at least three, which is just to say that we check to see whether there are at least three things that have both properties. At this point, you should be able to fill out at most three. I've given the framework and the relation we want to define is a cardinality one, roughly like in 26. Let's look at one more for now. This is the case of most, which is interesting because it shows a more complex relation. The intuitive analysis is that most x's are y's is true just in case more than half of the x's are y's. To calculate that, I've given it as an explicit proportion. Okay, there are lots of other determiners we could consider. We'll do that a bit later as we study the full class of determiners. Um, but we, want to have, we have what we need now to bring these meanings into our grammar. So you should be able, for example, at this point, to give a meaning for between 5 and 10 totally from scratch. Feel free to use the reference framework in 27 to get you started. 
and make sure that you can think about what the relation is. And keep in mind that in principle, you can do whatever you want to when it comes to specifying the relation. There are no formal limitations at this point. Just say what you think would lead to the correct semantic analysis in terms of the two input arguments, both sets, x and y. That's the nuts and bolts of quantifiers. To help us linger over the content a bit more, I've written out here an imagined dialogue between me and a very sharp but skeptical student. And I'm hoping this will help us get clearer on why we've defined quantificational determiners in this very elaborate looking way. So the student asks, you define quantificational determiners as denoting relations between sets of entities. Isn't that too complicated? And my reply is, it is complicated, but it's not too complicated. It's really the least complicated thing we could do. We need the determiner to control both its restriction and its scope. And the student replies, but couldn't every just denote the universe U? And here I can be firm, no way. We need to consider the role of the restriction, every child, every scholarly parent, and so forth. And so the student says, okay, then let's say that every student picks out the set of students and every parent the set of parents and so forth. That would at least be somewhat simpler. And I reply, that still won't work. Suppose the meaning of every student was the set of students, for example, what would we do with the verb phrase? We need the meaning of every student's skateboards to be false and the meaning of every student speaks to be true. What are the criteria for making that distinction? And here my imagined student falls into my rhetorical trap. The student says, well, the criteria could be subset as you gave it. The meaning of every student's skateboards is F because the set of students is not a subset of the set of skateboarders. But the meaning of every student speaks is T because the set of students is a subset of the set of things that speak. That's just like saying if X is a student, then X skateboards, and it seems intuitively correct. And I say, exactly, but that's just a rephrasing of the analysis we actually gave. You start with this claim here, with the set of students as a subset of the set Y. In our framework, we explicitly bind the variable Y, and that gives us lambda Y at the start. And this is intuitively a set of sets, and that captures the variation we just noted in truth values for different verb phrases. And this is the meaning of every student, in fact. And to get all the way back to the meaning of every, we just abstract out the first slot, too. And now we've arrived at our proposed meaning in 21. So here the student switches gears. Okay, you convince me for every, but surely no, no student, etc., can all just denote the empty set. That seems intuitively like what no means, right? Nothingness. And I say, no, that won't work. So consider no parent studies. This is true in our possible world, but neither the set of parents nor the set of things that study is empty in our possible world. It's their intersection that's required to be empty if this statement is true. And we wanna say that in general, and that's what our theory does, right? We can start again with a specific claim if we like. The set of parents and the set of things that study is empty. We back off to get the meaning of no parent by abstracting out the second slot and adding lambda y. And then we do that once more and we've got the meaning for no from 25. At this point, in my imagination at least, the student is ready to become the teacher. So the student says, I'm starting to see that this is the least complicated thing we can do. And I also see that this basic setup can work for lots of determiners. We start with our framework and then we just need to specify what the relation is for any given determiner. And I like this as a working strategy. And the student says, and if we want to, I can start with a specific instance of what I want to capture, like most students skateboard. And then just back out the variables with lambda binders, first for the scope and then for the restriction. And now I can only applaud. Beautiful. But then I have to add, and remember to always do the binding in the order that you did it in your example. Restriction outer, because it comes in first, and scope inside because it comes in second. And that's important because some determiners are order sensitive with respect to their arguments, like most and every. All right, excellent. That completes our introduction of the semantic lexicon. In the next screencast, we'll show how to bring all these meanings together when interpreting syntactic structures.